And welcome everyone to another edition of Orlando Magic Pod Squad presented by Kia, official vehicle of the Orlando Magic. And we're pleased to catch up myself, Dante Marcatelli, George Galante, and Pat Garrity, assistant general manager of the Detroit Pistons, kind enough to spend some time with us. And Pat, first of all, uh, we, we hope you're doing well. We hope you're feeling well. And please give us some tips on, on how we can pass the time here. <laughs> Well, I don't know, between well, down there, like, you should have no excuse for walking. Like, today's the first sunny day here in Detroit for about three weeks. So I, went, I just went for a walk. Um, I guess walking, re- worrying about your 401K, uh, <laughs> wa- wa- watching CNN, like, those are all. Like, I, I read this article on Eric Spolster today, and he actually looks like he had a very good way of dealing with this. He said his day hasn't changed at all, and then he, he reserves his time in the evening and the afternoon for catching up on the news, but it's like the last thing he does in the day. So um, I, I think that that's probably the right way to do it, and it's not good that I'm probably doing the opposite. <laughs> but then, Pat, but do you want that? Do you, it's true. But do you want that all sitting in your head right before you go to bed, though? Do you want yeah, no, that's... Yeah, no, good point. Yeah, because it's not the news isn't getting any better. So no, yeah, you're, you're right. No, it's funny you said that, Dante, because my wife, that was the last thing she did the other night before she went to bed. And she was up all night. <laughs> I wake I wake up in the morning. I slept like a baby. And I woke up in the morning. I looked at her. I was like, are you okay? And she's like, uh, the last thing I did was check the news. And I well, couldn't sleep all night. So uh, I don't advise that at all. Well, the last thing I did last night was watch the first episode of Tiger King. So that didn't, it didn't sit, seem to put me in a bad place <laughs> if I went to bed. We were going to get to, you, we were get you to instantly the felt, You instantly felt better about your life, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, so there's seven episodes. I got through episode six before I cashed in my chips. But what are your, what are your initial thoughts, your initial thoughts on Tiger King? Well, I didn't know. First of all, I think I was the only person that didn't even know this guy existed until the show came out. Because I had people talking about him and, you know, everyone had a story of having heard about him or something like that. Um, yeah, no, I, my wife and I were just talking, it's just like, it just goes to show there, like, there's something for everyone that, like, they get into in this world and, and like, dedicate their life and passion to. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Dante was just upset to learn that a tiger only costs, like, three grand. Like, he, he, like, he one by now. I've never in my life been intrigued with owning one or petting one. It has never no. come across my mind, Pat, to go pay admission and, and hold a cub or pet a tiger. No, it, it, like the cub thing was weird to me that that was, that was the whole deal was having a business just centered around petting cubs. And then you have like the rest of the tiger's life to like, you know, figure out what to do with it. Because, <laughs> because the money, the money making, it was like money making right. period, like three months and like, you know, imminent danger of killing you. Like the next 30 days. <laughs> it seems like a pretty high risk reward. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't. It's surprising that it would be a bad business model because he's Joe Exotic's a guy that seems like he's got it all together. I, I'm kind of surprised by that. What, so tell me about this. So we had here in Central Florida, we had our first week of homeschool. And I found out I'm not, I'm not a great teacher uh, to this point. I've got a five and a six-year-old. I know you both remember those ages. Uh, but we did our first week. How, how's Henry doing with homeschool? And are you guys... Are you guys pretty good teachers? Did you find Pat or? Well, no. Here's what here's so here's what happened. Uh, and he's a freshman in high school right now, and he's he's a really good student. He's done done really well. He doesn't love love school, but he does okay. really well. puts effort into it. So he's he's a good student. But when that when all of this happened, they just moved their spring break up to uh, up a week because we didn't know how long. So so he is his first week of just being at home was spring break. But then. Sure. So, so after about three days of doing nothing, we put him on like a schedule and like, I'm making him, you know, here's a book you have to read. Like you, we're, we're working out in the basement now he's doing yeah. So, so he was actually happy when school started up again, when, cause now they're doing like zoom classes and recorded classes and stuff like that. But his school is doing everything. So he goes, he sits at the table. His, his wake up time is a little liberal. He like, he gets his day going about 10 AM. Um, but, but he, he's at the table and, yeah, it's just like you guys. <laughs> but he's he's at the table till about two thirty, um, and, and he's doing stuff the whole time. Um, so it's the schools here are still. Um, they, they've just today announced that they're closing physical classrooms for the rest of the year. Um, but as I understand it, they're going to continue to provide them lessons and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, he's 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 doing a good job. 
Was Henry was Henry playing any sports pad at all, or, or was wait? He... Hold on, hold on. Was that so? Is that so? What I'm getting is that code for Paula's handling everything. Is, is that what? I'm... <laughs> no, she, she, yeah, she, the, the meals and no, the scheduling and making sure he's he's down what he's doing. But once he gets going, he gets locked in pretty good. Nice, but yeah, yeah. But, but but that is code. Yeah, she's she's the heavy. <laughs> she's the enforcer around here. <laughs> nice. Sorry, George. No, that's okay. Was he was he playing any sports at all, or or was you know like. Basketball. Is he playing yeah. basketball? Ba basketball. Uh, so they were just getting ready to go into the state tournament. So he, they, they play, um, and he plays for a Catholic school here. So they had just gotten done with a Catholic league tournament, and the st their first district game was when everything got canceled. So oh. that that immediately shut down, and then this, the AAU stuff obviously all completely done right now. So. Um, we're, we're lucky though. Get we have a weight room in the basement. We have a treadmill. We have, so so he's it's it's actually you know. And I was talking to another dad about this for young basketball players. This is actually like a very good time for them to focus on strength training because yeah. when you normally how it works is these guys finish their high school season, then they go right into AAU, and they don't really ever have time to learn how to lift and get their bodies right. So that's that's how we've been using this time right now. Just being consistent with his training and you know he's got a hoop outside so he shoots on that but it's I really see this time he's 14 years old this is the time to like get his get his body right no that's George you may not know this what Pat wasn't he down in Orlando as part of the junior NBA he's you're, you're Henry's pretty good he's a pretty good basketball player isn't he yeah 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 he was he was with the Midwest team that oh. um that, that won the Midwest regional so they went down to the junior NBA it's only for 14 and under so they, they do it for that age group. So, yeah, his team went down there, and uh, it, it was good. So Awesome. Yeah. They did awesome. a good job. Is it, hard, cool. is it hard as a parent? Because I, I, I imagine for me, and I didn't play in the NBA. You guys may not know that, but I, I never <laughs> met it. <laughs> but is, I imagine when my daughters start playing sports, it's going to be hard for me to sit there and keep my mouth closed as other parents are saying whatever. Well, what is your viewing <laughs> uh, situation? Are you, are you with the other parents? Are you by yourself? How, how do you – how do you get through? Well, well I go, I'm usually kind of by myself because okay. um, I don't want to just, I, I want to watch the game. I don't want to talk to anyone else. I don't want to like, ch ch you know, chat about the game. So I'm usually by myself and I've gotten a little bit better. I used to be more like of a screamer and vocal, but now I've, I've learned to control myself a little bit better. Although I do sit at the very top of the bleachers and the video guy is like filming right above me and I have caught my when I go back and watch the film because it's on how I have heard myself on video a few times so I guess I'm not doing as good a job as, is, as maybe I should be. Is there a correlation to when it started to go down <laughs> after you heard yourself screaming on the video? Yeah yeah I'm like oh I can't be yeah the coach is hearing me I, I better I better tone it down a little bit. Better tone it down a little. Well Pat I know uh, obviously these are these are something we've never gone through these times and it's uh, obviously, everyone's doing their best, and we, we know we encourage everyone to be home during these times, but uh, we found out there's a number of NBA players that have, have come down with COVID-19 and, and have recovered, and, and one of them yeah. was on your team and Christian Wood. So uh, let, us, let us know how that all went down and, and kind of what that felt like in the organization and, and how he's doing now. Well, yeah, I mean, how, how it went down was we had, we'd played, I think, uh, Utah on a, on a Saturday, and then the team went on went on a road trip, and it was the, the, the Wednesday, the following Wednesday night when when it came out that that Rudy Gobert tested positive. That was that was a crazy time. I mean, it was yeah. you, you know you didn't really know how to react, and and all credit goes to like our our doctor and our medical director and our trainer. I mean, they they made very quick decisions right after the game to to isolate the team and get them back on the plane and. When they got home, the orders were given as, hey, you guys, you know, 14 days, stay at, stay at home, no contact with anyone. You can go outside for a walk, but you got to be – this is serious stuff. And, you know, that night of the game, um, you, Christian wasn't feeling well, um, but decided – thought, thought he just had, you know, maybe a little cold or flu or something, but he wasn't feeling well. He ended up having like 30 and 15 against Embiid and, and had like one of his best games of the season. Not feeling well. Uh, with the viral wow. That's yeah, go 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 look at his line from that game. It was it was amazing. And but you know, just because of his symptoms, um, you know, was tested, came back that he was positive. And and actually, by the time the, the test results came back, he was already feeling 
feeling better and on his way to recovering. So from my understanding, he, you know, he, he was, he got through it pretty, pretty easily, as easily as you can in that kind of circumstances. But yeah, for everyone else, it was, it was, you know, locked down, stay at home. Everyone who was with, with the team on the plane, it was, it was two weeks of that. Did that cause some, a lot of uneasiness between, you know, the, especially the guys that were on the plane and, and traveling? Did that just cause a lot of uneasiness throughout the organization? No, no, I wouldn't say it caused uneasiness. I mean, it was definitely something that people had to adapt to. But, I, you know, everyone was very compliant with it. You know, we made, made sure that we were in touch with everyone every day. We had a, we had a conference call for everyone on the plane every day. Someone could, you could dial into it. Our doctor would give an update on what was going on with the thing. And, um, and folks were terrific with following instructions and, and doing what they were asked to do. You know, and you got to applaud Adam Silver, don't you, Pat? I know you probably were privy to a lot more conversations than we were, but just, uh, just how he was and seemed to be in front of this from the beginning. And then from the yeah. second we heard about Gobert, he was the first league to shut down. He took it that serious and just, uh, it just seemed to be very prepared to handle it the right way. Yeah. You know, I, I, from my understanding, this it didn't. Even though it was very sudden in how it happened, they were obviously having conversations right. and following this really closely for a while. Um, and you know, and I thought that the they have been um, they've been in communication with teams every day, just in terms of you know updating teams and providing guidelines. But I think the most important thing they did is they just bought themselves time. They they didn't allow any gray area. They shut the whole thing down. They shut practice facilities down. Um, and, and allowed themselves time to think and to, to do the right thing. So um, I don't think anyone, when this happened, I, you know, we, we thought maybe we'd get back to it in the summer, but I don't think we, we imagined how long this was going to go. And then, Pat, as the, as the assistant GM, like, what do you guys do? I mean, I know our guys were, were constantly, you know, in communication with the players and, yeah. and making sure they're all set up at their houses. Like, give us kind of an insight, you know, as to what you guys were, were doing and how you were communicating with the various parts of your staff. Yeah. So, I mean, we would, the, the front office and, you know, leadership meet, we get on a call every day of what we were doing. I think that the main things were during that quarantine period was just taking care of people's daily living needs. Cause you know, a lot of these guys are young guys and um, you know, they're used to just going out to eat every meal. So um, the, the, the provider of our food service plum market um, stepped in right away. I mean, we were delivering meals to guys, um, you know, leave it on the door, knock on the door, they'd come get it. <laughs> um, you know, so, um, and then really that, because of that two week period, you really couldn't, the, the strength coaches and trainers were quarantined too. So it's not like they could go out and get equipment. So that was just a period of, you know, maybe we ordered some things to get to deliver to guys house. But then after that, um, we did a lot of what most teams are doing. We're either ordering equipment, we're delivering their houses. Um, you know, guys are finding tracks to go kind of work and, and, and run on and, um, you know, trying to, trying to be clever with how we're making sure these guys are being fed and taken care of because I mean the last thing we want them to do is go to like a grocery store right now you know be walking around like it's the, the stay-at-home order in Michigan here is is pretty much shut you know everything down so it's just been a lot of trying to take care of the guys that have you know that are, that are around. Well some of those guys Pat I, I know you know the Magic got off to a slow start I, I know you guys expected maybe different Blake Griffin gets hurt and that turns things yeah. around and and you make a move with Andre Drummond. But two of the better stories in the NBA, I think, are Christian Wood, who you've mentioned already, and Derek Rose. I, I mean, that has been from afar, watching those two this year. D just hit on those guys and, and kind of how you even acquired them and you know, kind of how that all came to be and the years that they were having for you. Yeah, so, you know, Derek, Derek was a guy that obviously – you know, hit, hit some bumps in his career through his time in, in Cleveland and then kind of picked it up and, and showed he could still do it in Minnesota. And so um, we were really fortunate to be able to get him, you know, and, and I had known about obviously how talented of a player he was. I, I didn't know about his level of professionalism and how, how we really he's adored by his teammates. And so we got not only a good player, but we got a, a great leader too. So he's been nothing but a bright spot for us this year. Um, and, and then Christian Wood was a guy that we, we actually acquired off waivers. So he was waived by New Orleans during the summer. Um, he, had a, he had a contract that was non-guaranteed up to a certain point, I think right before camp. So 
you know, he, we had, we had watched what he had done with, with new Orleans, um, you know, obviously immense talent, great body and length. Uh, so we had the opportunity to pick him up. And, and when we, we got him, it was like every day in training camp, he was just one of the best players on the floor. And it was like, Oh yeah, he had a good day today. Let's see. And then it was like, Oh yeah. And then by the end of the week, it was like, this guy is like, probably one of our three best players right now. So, (laughs) so, um, you know, he's, he's, he's done a great job and he, he previously at this point in his career had had, you know, bounced around a little bit, but you know, he, he really kind of stepped up when given the opportunity and stayed healthy, banged up a few times, played through injury. So he, he's had a terrific season for us. So did his development make it a little easier for you guys to, to pull the trigger then with Andre? Uh, I wouldn't say that, um, I wouldn't say the two were necessarily like that, that closely linked. Um, you know, the, the Andre decision was just the financial commitment to next year. And, you know, coming into the season, he had, you know, it had been reported and he'd said it publicly that he was going to, he was going to opt out. Um, but so, so like it was really a, a difficult situation for the team. So he, he, if he opts out, that means he's obviously going to want more than he had in his option year. And then, you know, and if he opted in, it was, we were just at a point with the rest of our team that it offered really limited kind of flexibility with what to do. And so, you know, looking at that situation, the trade that and how we'd been performing as a team, it was really, it was really, really difficult to, to say, okay, we're going to go in and try to try to do this again next year. Uh, but but I would say though that you know having someone like like Christian you know performing like he was was, was a bonus. But Christian's going to be an unrestricted free agent at the end of the season, so there's no you know there's obviously no guarantee sure. and no control in those kind of situations. Sure. You know what's cool about Pat George? He did he, you know once he retired, he tried a couple of things, went back to school, <laughs> he tried broadcasting for about six months, realized that wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't interested. In that. Right, <laughs> so, right. He said, "I actually want to do something impactful with my." <laughs> <laughs> as an assistant general manager, Pat, how are you enjoying that role and, and your responsibilities? And this has got to be a lot of fun for you. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been good. And it's um, now this is the, the second front office here in Detroit. I came in with Stan and Jeff Bauer and was right. fortunate enough to stay on with, um, with, with Arn and with Ed. So it, um, my role has been, has been great because I get the, you know, the, the, the basketball part obviously is the most important part of evaluating people and making the right decisions for personnel. But, you know, specifically the other thing that I do is I, I work with our performance group and our medical group. And so that's always been a part um, of the game. And when I was a player that obviously very interested in, um, you know, I'm too much experience in the medical side toward, toward the end of my career. Um, but, but, you know, it did give me, you know, when you go through that kind of thing, it gives you the appreciation for, um, having really like great, you know, not only people that are great at their jobs, but work together well, communicate with one another and are really selfless in their approach of caring for players. And so having that as part of my responsibility is, you know, building that team and working with that team has been a lot of fun over the last year or two. How much have you seen that aspect evolve, Pat? I know when this first started, this whole high performance thing, yeah. I, I think everybody thought, hey, we've been doing this for a while. We got it covered. We know how to do it. But I tell you, the information that you now have at your disposal and, and the things that we've learned since we've kind of ramped up these medical teams and high performance teams, is pretty overwhelming. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable yeah. how they are able to, to get even more out of these guys. Yeah, no, it, it is. And it's, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm someone who, you know, is obviously always interested in the, the science part of it and love listening to what our guys say. Um, the, the part that I worry about a little bit is, is make, you know, number one, kind of overcomplicating what it takes to actually get a player physically prepared to play. And number two is kind of just, and, and you have to be worried about it because when guys get injured, um, and are not available, you can see what happened to our team this season. But, but I think that there's also a danger of just being hyper-focused on, you know, pushing these guys hard and doing too much. And, and so I, I, it's, a, it's an open question in my mind. And like, are we taking too conservative of an approach? Um, so that's, I think that that's something that, um, that everyone's struggling with right now. Sure. Yeah. yeah. As we try to cipher through this, you may or may not know this, but 20 year anniversary of the heart and hustle team, which is, uh-huh. I mean, makes me feel young. 
thinking that was 20 years ago. <laughs> but we just put Daryl Armstrong into our uh, Orlando Magic Hall of Fame. Yeah. You know, since you've left and, and since you were retired and living in town, people, George and I talk about this all the time, people remember the 95 finals team. They remember the 09 finals team. But right up there with them, and in some mind ahead of them, is that heart and hustle team. Does it blow your mind, one, that it's been 20 years, and two, just how much impact that team had on this community? I feel like Pat has aged better than both of us, by the way. Like, we, really? we got a little bit of, we got a little, like, you know, like I'm, as I'm trying to play with this beard, I got gray everywhere, and Dante clearly has more gray than, than all of us combined, but... And Pat's just sitting there. He's like, yeah, no big deal. I need to, yeah. My, well, I've grown my hair out. My wife hates it because she's starting to see some gray. So I think I'm going to have to go shorter right now. Okay. Um, well, no, the thing that I think about that team, and I don't know if, if you go and ask like John Gabriel and those guys, like that was uh, the way I describe that team, that was the tank gone wrong. Yeah, really. <laughs> it was the really tank was. Gone wrong. Like that if, if there was like that was the first time if you can maybe there were other teams that, that you look at how they dismantled that team that was knocking on the door of, of finals with the guys that they had and totally dism and, and it was the tanking playbook. Or like yeah. originally they got picks, got players on rookie contracts, cut payroll for you know, obviously the, the two max slots the next summer, but they went, it got, it went wrong. Cause they had, they got the hall of famer in Ben Wallace, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. you know, they had all these other players that, you know, they came in and contributed and a coach that's probably going to be in the hall of fame too. Yeah, that's right. And, so, guys, and guys that, and guys that yeah. didn't know how to play any other way than everything you had. That, that's, that's not yeah. part of the playbook either. No, no. And I think that that's the, the thing is, is, you know, you you obviously took it for granted back then, but now if you're if you're looking in a position of trying to go that route where you're going young and you're saying okay we're going to put around them veterans that are going to be good veterans but maybe you know not too expensive of that kind of like Daryl Armstrong, Bo Outlaw, Monty Williams, like those were the veterans on their team. You know Chris Gatling for half the season, like those were the veterans on that team, and. Um, you know, they all had different personalities, but the one thing they all had in common is like when it came time to work and to practice and to play, like competing and going and being pros was the number one thing on the list. So like if you were a young guy like me and uh, Mike Doliak and, you know, Harper was there for you, like that was the, that was the only way there was, was to, to go out there and work and compete. Yeah. Right. And then now if you don't, if, if, if you don't know Magic fans, if you look at the games played list, all time in Magic history, you have Nick Anderson, Jameer Nelson, Dwight Howard, Nick Vucevic, and then fifth is Pat Garrity with 513 Whoa. games. I don't know if you I knew that. I, I don't think I did know that. <laughs> You're fifth all time in the history of the Magic for, for games played. You, you've been through, I mean, you went through the Hard and Hustle era, then you were here, obviously, when, when, when Grant and T-Mac came on board, and then you stayed on in the early parts of, of the Dwight Howard, Jameer Nelson uh, regime, too. You've seen it all with the match. Is that a, is that is that the definition of an untradeable contract? I mean, my contract didn't seem that bad. <laughs> well, wait, well, wait a second. You've also, when you look back at your transactions, you've also been traded for Dirk Nowitzki and Penny Hardaway. That's what you should yeah. tell everybody. Like, it was so good no. that they traded for and, Dirk and, and Steve Nash was it? And Steve Nash <laughs> and Steve Nash. Yeah. I mean, come on. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, no, I was. I, it's just when I think back, it blows my mind. I was in one place for so long. Like I was a role player. Like you're not like I was the type of player that should have just been bouncing around every couple of years. So the fact that I was there for long, it was just you know blind luck. <laughs> when you got you make the move, Pat, for Tracy McGrady. I know things. We all wish things worked out different with Grant, and and I know you got to know him well his time here. And he, no one did more than him to try to get out there. The guy did everything he could to be yeah, out there. Yeah. But to see Tracy become the player that he was and, and to watch that on a nightly basis, I mean, that was – for us to watch and witness was something special. I know it must have been yeah. for you. Yeah, no, it was, it was crazy too. And then when you – you know, there were the other guys I think that were, that were being pursued that summer, obviously Tim Duncan was one of them. Right. But Eddie, Eddie Jones, you know, ended up going to Miami. And, and I, from what I understand, like Eddie Jones and T-Mac, it was like, which one do we want? Um, that wow, and, and Eddie Jones, obviously a great player, but like T Mac, yeah. Um, he, he, the, the most amazing thing about him was like he everyone remembers him for his scoring, 
Um, and obviously, he was a great scorer. I think he led the NBA in scoring. He and Iverson and Kobe were kind of – but of all the guys that I play with, he might – he might be one of the highest like basketball IQ guys. I think that, that I played with that, that whole time. Obviously Grant was really smart player, you know, Jameer, but uh, you know, Dwight really smart, but, but T-Mac just his ability to like, the game was in slow motion for him. And, you know, I think he could not only score, he saw the whole floor. Like he was one of the best passers that I've ever played with. Um, yeah. He was an incredible, incredible player. Now we had we had T Mac on uh, before we talked to you, and we were kind of going through uh, some of his favorite plays during the, during his time with the Magic and and our plays. And what came up in the conversation very early was your dunk on Sam D'Alembert. <laughs> he, said, he said that was a sneaky, sneaky dunk. <laughs> it was sneaky. Yeah. No, I. Yeah, I, I, I my son still. I really I didn't give you a question. I just told you yeah. it was a great play. <laughs> No, that was that was fun. So you know, you mentioned uh, Eddie Jones or Tracy McGrady, but think about you were here when do we draft Dwight Howard or Emeka Okafor? Yeah, um, yeah exactly. You were here for that decision too, and again, Emeka Okafor, great player when he, but you know, obviously had those health injuries, and and Dwight's obviously going to be a Hall of Famer one day. So that's a tough. You can appreciate that side now being in a front office, but yeah. that, from what I understand, Pat, that was not an easy decision at the time either. I, I don't. I don't think it was either. And I. I was just listening to a podcast recently where I think someone was trying to make the case where like you could have justified it, and if Omeka didn't get hurt and all that. Like I think at the time you could have justified it by just saying I didn't know Dwight Howard was going to become you know yeah. a, a, the center that he did, um, but. I, I think a lot of people right now looking back at that one, they actually forget how great of a player Dwight Howard was in his peak with Orlando. Like multiple, multiple All NBA seasons. I, I mean, I think a couple of years he ended he ended in the top five for MVP voting. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, that. But but again, you're right. Like when you looked at what what I think Otis who drafted him was going off of was was high school film. And he didn't have the body that he had two years or three years after that. He looked kind of like a skinny kid. And he was talking about, you know, putting the cross on the NBA logo and that he played That's point guard. Right. Like, <laughs> it, it, just, it, just, right, it just showed you how – it just showed you how hard, it, like, the decision – like, to take that starting point of just this young kid and, and to project what he was going to become, like, who, no one could have, have known that, right? No, no way. Do, do you remember the tape? Remember he came in for a workout. Do you remember the piece of tape that was at the RDV Sportsplex? On yeah, the back? yeah. I mean, that, that, do you remember that, Dante? There was a yeah. piece of tape on one of the hoops uh, from when Dwight came in for his workout. How high would you think that, that mark was, Pat? I mean, it was well above the square. 12, like was, 12, yeah. 6. I mean, it was yeah, so it was high. Good. So yeah. high. Yeah, it was near the, it was near the top of the backboard. Sorry, the FedEx guy just delivered something. That's it. Dog's <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, and, and that's that's the one thing that I think that like when you're when you're faced with that kind of decision, like Dwight had physical tools that were like you know one in I don't know you know one in a million or something. Like he had elite physical tools compared to NBA players, and so I think in those kind of situations, you just go with that and you say, look, we're gonna you know try to develop them, and 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 luckily he not only had that, but he had like extremely high basketball IQ, and you know. He didn't develop. I, I think he gets knocked for not developing kind of as an individual offensive threat. Um, but what he is, what he was able to do on the defensive end was like he's one of the best defensive centers that's ever played what, that time during his during his peak, in my opinion. There's another defensive center you mentioned him. Do you feel Ben Wallace has a chance to get into the Hall of Fame one day? I mean, he's got a he's got a championship. He's he's got the Defensive Player of the Year and was a great rebounder. But even if he doesn't, that was one heck of a career he put together. Yeah, I think those are. And I'm not good at these. Like, should he or should he right, be in right, the Hall right. of Fame? Career. I think the thing that he has going for him though is that he was one of the key players on a team that over probably the course of a 10 year period or so was like one of the best in the league. Yeah. And so even. Uh, you know, like if you combine what he did, how integral it was, he was to that team and the, and the winning that, that they did, I think that that kind of pushes him, put, pushes it in his favor. Yeah, certainly does. All right. Lastly, Pat, I don't know about you, but we got lists of chores that I'm getting done. I'm building things. I'm putting things on the wall. Is there anything you've done? Are you, are you, you got a list that you're going through and getting stuff done at home? Ooh, 
yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's 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 a, a list of. I'm not the most like handy person in the world, but <laughs> it's a lot of well, a lot of Zoom conference calls, a lot yeah. of fil- film on draft guys. Yeah, um, and these don't these don't sound like chores. These don't sound yeah. like chores. <laughs> That's work. That's work. Right. And yeah, and then walks and working out like it's pretty. It's pretty simple. So. Well, and now, you, and, now, and now you know that the Orlando Magic pod squad is out there. I saw you combing through past episodes. Yeah. Which one are you looking forward to listening to the most? Oh, well, the Sid Powell, I think <laughs> that's got to go to the top of the, the list. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to put that one on first and then just work my way back. There you go. There you go. I, that's a good one to start with, I think. Right, Dante? <laughs> It may surprise you that Sid didn't hold back on that. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a straight shooter, that guy. All right, Pat, we appreciate the time, man. Keep up the good work, and thanks for taking time to check in on us. And, uh, and uh, stay safe, most importantly. Right. We'll catch up soon. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Right, good to see you guys. Magic Pod Squad, presented by Kia, the official vehicle of the Orlando Magic.